may not be suitable for all audiences. I don't know, man. Tests are culturally biased. Well, everything is culturally biased, Leon. I'm just trying to get you to college. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and I'm a master educator attempting to provide you with the best in our historical content. If you like that content, please make sure that you like, share, subscribe. There's all kinds of things down in the description below that you can interact with and uh, I appreciate your, uh, your work on that. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of, but you have heard of me. So today I thought I'd have a little fireside chat with you about one of the great post-impressionists, Paul Cezanne. He's really kind of a, an enigma of an artist and a kind of a personality. So without further, let's, uh, let's jump right on into that. Paul Cezanne was a leading post-impressionist in the style of proto-cubism and one of the innovators of modern art. Cezanne was born about 400 miles from Paris and growing up, he struggled in school and took a few art classes. There were things about Cezanne that were quite frankly very average. He loved to swim, he was a morning person, and he saw himself personally drawn to Napoleon. His very well-off family had built a fortune in banking and the family was going to continue to prosper with Paul being educated as a lawyer. It was his father's idea to have him study law, but Paul, he was driven toward a career in art. When Paul decided he was going to become an artist, his mother was very supportive, but his father, well, he was a little bit less than thrilled. Strangely enough though, although Cezanne's father was a little bit disappointed in his career choice, it was his family that made him such a huge success. Cezanne worked only to satisfy himself. He could care less about people commissioning his work, selling his work, or what other people thought of his work. Because of his family's wealth, Money was a complete non-issue to him. In fact, he rarely sold any of his artwork at all. And it is this limited success that likely kept him working as his own artist. And it was his vision of what his art should be that has made him extremely popular to this day. Well, you know, strikes and gutters, ups and downs. Now picture it, it was 1861. I thought you said that we weren't going to have to know dates. It's just for context. Anyway, Cezanne had taken off for Paris. He applied and was rejected to a art training school in Paris. And once he got there, he was kind of seen as this kind of country bumpkin. But a lot of this act was kind of played up by Cezanne himself, trying to make himself look a little more country than he probably really was. But at any rate, many people that have done research on Cezanne, including myself, would say that he was kind of a odd man at best. But we'll get into more of that in a moment. Attempting to improve himself, he was spending a lot of time in his early years copying the masters at the Louvre especially Peter Paul Rubens, who Cezanne said, that's what a painter is, just as Beethoven is the musician and Plato is the philosopher. He also enjoyed the works of Eugène Delacroix. Soon Cezanne would abandon his study of the masters and begin to focus his energies on nature, saying that all pictures painted inside, in the studio, will never be as good as those done outside. You guys have to come in the water! Within Paul Cezanne's circle of friends that he was making in Paris was Mary Cassatt, one of the masters of Impressionism. After one particular dinner gathering, she told a friend that Cezanne, quote, takes his chop in his fingers and pulls the meat from the bone. 
Although she was a little bit shocked by his manners, she would go on to say that he shows politeness towards women which no other man that she had come in contact with had done. He was a brute. But he was a brute that was kind of unbrutish. There are many examples of this opposite sort of personality in Cezanne. He wanted to overturn art traditions in drawing, painting, technique, proportion, and so forth, but he practiced the traditions that he wanted to have changed. He would cuss and swear all the time, but would memorize these long passages of Virgil in Latin. His critics, who he absolutely hated, would say that he was unable to draw, but he would go to the Louvre all of the time, copying the artwork into his sketchbooks. He hated priests, but would attend Mass every week. He hated the Paris Salon, but submitted work there every single year. He felt that he was a failure as an artist, but he had a pet parrot who he taught to say, Cezanne is a great painter. There were several odd quirks in the personality of Cezanne. To go a little further, he did not like to be touched, not even by his own son, and was very cautious with women. Paul was getting a little bit more into the Paris art scene when he met a very pretty 19-year-old artist and model and he became pretty infatuated with her. In fact, Cezanne fell in love and began to live with the young girl that was 11 years younger than he. But Cezanne being Cezanne, he did not want to explain this relationship to his father, so he just didn't bring it up. And after he went so long not bringing it up, it would have seemed weird to bring it up, so he just kept not bringing it up. And he ended up not bringing it up for some 17 years. As a matter of fact, within those 17 years, she and Paul had Paul Jr., who was born in 1872. But eventually, he did decide to bring it up, and the two were married in 1886. If that's a joke, I love it. If not, I cannot wait to unpack that with you. Paul Cezanne refused to compromise his artistic styles. Even for the French Salon, he would not compromise. He created work for the French Salon that he knew would be rejected. Although it was rejected, he would still learn from these artistic experiences and through those experiences met new people and one of the rings of people that he would get involved with would eventually become known as the Impressionists. In 1863, he would get invited into a show known as the Salon des Refusés. This would have a big impact on his associations with artists. Then, on April the 15th, 1874, he would participate in the first exhibition of these Impressionists when it opened up for their first exhibition, I guess. Although he was seen as an Impressionist, he would only participate in one other show, and that was in 1877. And it was with reluctance that they even allowed him into the show in the first place. He had created some paintings that were a little bit controversial. He, being the brute that he was, made some enemies in the art community. And quite frankly, they just didn't want to let him in. But because Edgar Degas was inviting all of these other realist painters into the show, well, they had no choice but to let him in to kind of offset the balance between the realists and the impressionist type painters. When creating his work, he was one that actually preferred to work in oil and watercolor paint. After looking at a subject for a long period of time, he would suddenly spring into action and get to work. It was first very roughly drawn, but not a lot of time was spent on this drawing. It was very gestural. It was very quick and spontaneous. He wanted to get the sense of it down on the canvas. Then, when painting and working, he would focus on the most complex images and break them down into simple geometric shapes. Rather than shading the canvas in the traditional way of building up layers of paint, by light to dark or vice versa, he would work by juxtapositioning differently colored shapes that were patched onto the canvas. Because he sees this as the ideal way to create a picture, he questions the use of using one point perspective. A viewer of his work sees an uneven structure of painting that was truly a style years before its time. 
Cezanne was one that feared other artists would steal his secrets and his ideas, especially when it came to color usage. Gustave Courbet had developed a painting technique that was adopted by Cezanne, where the painting knife was used in place of a brush, using quick aggressive slashes at the canvas. Cezanne was on the verge of attacking the canvas with a violence of artistry. There were some rare occasions where he would paint with others like his friend and teacher and something of a father figure Camille Pizarro, but most of the time he preferred to paint in isolation. He was very protective of his privacy, even at the peak of his fame. He would get violently upset by people that crossed the line between his public and private life. He was also a bit insecure about his abilities and had something of an imposter syndrome going on. He was so convinced that no one wanted to see his paintings that he would literally abandon them in locations where they were painted, leaving the paint, the canvas, the easel, the whole bit just to disintegrate in the woods somewhere when frustrated with a painting's progress. It was very difficult for him to see his own skill. It's not true, Dale. Don't be ridiculous. Paul Cezanne would take great pains to make sure that each one of his observational still lives was set up just so. He would have piles of coins hidden to prop up odd objects like skulls and plaster casts along with an assortment of other bottles and apples and other things. We get a better idea of how Cezanne worked based on the accounts of Villard, the young art dealer who gave Cezanne his first exhibition. Villard was to sit for a painting. Villard would come in and sit for about four hours at a stretch, but it would take Cezanne 115 days to create the painting. This would amount to 460 hours of Villard sitting in pose so Cezanne could create this painting. Cezanne was very serious and overly critical as he worked painfully slow. He had a violent temper and would go off in an instant. On one occasion, he got so frustrated with his painting process that he tore down about 10 watercolor paintings off from his wall and in his studio and tossed them into a fire. And then he was perfectly calm. He sat down and resumed painting. He was blunt with his artistic opinions. On another occasion, a very excited Vincent Van Gogh showed up to ask Cezanne his opinion of one of his paintings, to which he replied, you positively paint like a madman. With a career that began with still lives, Cezanne would evolve into using the addition of the human form in the early 1890s. One of those really great works, at least in my opinion, was The Card Players. For Cezanne, this was a study of life and volume. He builds a volume with tonal build almost independently. This was a theme that he repeated five times. He was able to repeat this so often because each person was painted individually and then assembled in the painting later. Each of the models that sat was paid five francs each per session. In 1902, Paul Cezanne would build a brand new studio in Aix, France. It was close to his favorite view of his most favorite subject, Mount Saint-Vétois, a mountain that he had painted in oil over 30 times and in watercolor dozens of times as well. This major force in his landscape was a huge influence to his art. Now beyond that, Cezanne loved the solitude that came with painting in this backcountry region and so obviously he wanted his studio to go there. We should be inquisitive. We should want knowledge. Knowledge is power. He had been diagnosed with diabetes in 1890 and as a result his eyesight may have been failing as he was painting in his later years. In October of 1906, Cezanne had left his studio to paint the mountains. Now while he was walking out there he ended up getting caught in a thunderstorm. Without the energy to return home, he had collapsed on a backcountry road. Eventually, he would be found and carried back to town on a laundry cart. In his last letter to his art dealer, he wrote, I want to die painting. Just six days later, he did just that. 
After his passing, his art would live on as an inspiration to other artists like Henri Matisse, George Brock, and Pablo Picasso, as well as hordes of other artists who were perhaps less obviously influenced by Cezanne, like Alberto Giacometti, Max Beckman, and Jasper Johns. But to me, he was one of the true artists of all time. He could care less about shows, he didn't give a crap about galleries, he didn't care about sales, all he cared about was the final product. He told you straight what his opinion was, and he was absorbed with the work of creating great works of art. And that alone, regardless of the cost to him personally or professionally, in my opinion, makes him a true artist's artist. I love bringing you that story, hopefully as much as you enjoy hearing it, and uh, I appreciate your interactions on the video and the channel. We'll see you next time. You have yourself a good day. The only difference between me and a homeless man is his job. I will do whatever it takes to survive, like I did when I was a homeless man.